Nice to have you here again this Sunday afternoon in London, England, Europe. No, not Europe anymore. Oh, my goodness. Let me tell you what um, submissions we've got today. Uh, we've got fantasy science fiction. Uh, I've got fantasy, so two lots of fantasy so far. We've got new adult fiction. We'll be exploring what that is in a minute. Uh, we've got contemporary thriller. And we've got criminal urban fantasy. So if any of that floats your boat, even if it doesn't, just stick around for the next 60 minutes as we try to discover the next bestsellers with your help, with the help of the Genius Room, and particularly the help of my guests. Now, after editing nearly 100 books, 100 books, can you believe that, for children? Oh, she decided to write a few bestsellers herself. What took you so long, Sarah? It's Sarah Grant! <laughs> Hello! Uh, she's, a, she's a flamenco fanatic, a fandango fiend, and a pretty yeah. good word slinger too. Yeah, it's Latopia's own Annie Summerlee. How about that? We've got um, we've got an endorsement here for us. Uh, this is from Sarah. Thank you very much for sending this, Sarah. I was on, on last week. Uh, Wolf Titan feedback was brilliant, Sarah says. I've been thus inspired to a frenzy of revisions across the board. Good. I'm looking forward to submitting again while I've had a bit of an edit. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sarah, actually. Much appreciated that. Um, it's always good, you know, because we review your manuscripts. You can review us. Fair enough, isn't it? Um, let's have a look at the leaderboard so far this month. It's still very early. Let's see who's got the big sexy smile. Oh my goodness me, it's quite tightly bunched as you can see. All five submissions are, well, within certainly, what, eight, eight points of each other? Uh, uh, no, a first place. Uh, you can't knock it, can you? 64 points for Damien with My Grandad Picks His Nose. I wonder if anything is going to beat that this week. I really wonder. Um, now, why are, we, uh, why are we doing this? What are we getting all these monthly leaderboards and points for? Well, the answer is, it's quite a new system we've got going, but each month we do work out a winner. Well, actually, you do too, because you vote live on the show. And what happens to that winner? Something rather special. With over 100 worldwide number one bestsellers, Head of Zeus is a formidable British-based publishing powerhouse. Independent Publisher of the Year, Digital Business of the Year. The awards and tributes keep rolling in. Now, Pop-Up Submissions has partnered with Head of Zeus to find tomorrow's best-selling authors. Each month's Pop-Up winner will be fast-tracked straight to them for their expert consideration. We know writing is never easy, but now Pop-Up Submissions makes it easier for you and your work to find a great publishing home. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool, don't you? Uh, it's a new route to publication, and this day and age, every writer needs that. Let's get straight on and look at our very first submission. Thank you, Priscilla. I completely agree. This is from Asmus. Asmus Neogard. I've got to say, that is such a writerly name. What a great name that is. I wonder if it's real. I'm sure. What's Asmus is saying right now? What's, of course it's real. I was born with it. Yes, but it's, it's a good name. This is fantasy science fiction. It's called The Grantston Chronicles. Colon, Expedition to Mandawa. And this is your blurb. It all started with a bet, and so it begins. Dashiell Remington's travel to the great desert of Mandawa, where explorers go when there's nothing left to explore. To succeed, Dashiell has to rely on his crew of diverse personalities like the metal man Brick, the serious engineer Liana Jenkins, the partners in business, as well as in life, Rollo and Mr. Took. Mr. Took? Is that the wrong book? Uh, but before Dashiell can claim his reward, he and his expedition have to brave righteous curators, vicious scorpions, and their own pasts. And um, I think you've been truncated there, Asmus. Sorry about that. Um, but it does, you know, there's a little ticker 
when you um, type the, the blurb in on the website, and it does count the, the number of characters you've got left, and you've just slightly exceeded that, I'm afraid. Um, but let me tell everybody about you. My name is Asmus. I'm a 34-year-old Dane. Great Dane. <laughs> Probably not the first time you've heard that. Uh, now living just south of London with my wife. I work in marketing and have been writing stories since I was a child. Expedition to Mandawa is the first book in a series of at least seven. That sounds great. You want a good, strong, stirring reading. I'll be bound, and it's going to be Robert. The Grantston Chronicles, Expedition to Mandawa, by Asmus, read by Robert. It started, as such things often do, with a bet. Chapter 1. It was in the metropolis of Granston, the centre of civilization in the Northern Empire. Inside, the Hall of Adventurous Gentlemen were engrossed in discussions. Around them, trinkets and artefacts from imperial provinces and exotic locations were displayed on walls and in glass cases, with small brass signs giving information about what the trinket is and who found it. A pristine trident from the underwater civilization of Bay Sla. Sir Edmund Wolfenhart, a photograph of a machinist forge, Mr. Charles Destier, a cubic piece of building brick from the World Spire, donated by the Emperor Albert Octavus, and even a bone fragment from the Skull City of Umbrian, kept in a preservative liquid, Mr. Joseph Descargot. White glove waiters zipped dignified through the smoking room, exchanging empty glasses with full ones emptying ashtrays and tidying the room, careful not to disturb the various discussions, talks, and whispered conversations taking place there. My dear Mr. Remington, the esteemed Sir Habengut said in his familiar booming voice, you've been here for quite a while now, he waved his hands expansively. Are you growing roots? Deshiel Remington smiled at the comment, Sir Habengut had not been outside Granston for years, preferring to live an adventuring life by proxy, sponsoring others' expeditions and adventures. As such, Sir Habengut had not as much grown roots as having grown into a mature oak. I'm looking for the right challenge, Sir Habengut. Indeed, Habengut boomed, waving a hand and sloshing expensive brandy on the velvet upholstery of his favourite chair. You already contributed handsomely to our growing collection. It could be time to relax. It was true. De Scheel had done his share of exploring for the Empire, and had the trophies and the scars to show for it. Still, he did detect something in the big man's voice. I don't think so he said. I think my greatest adventure is still ahead of me. And what would that be? Something no one has attempted, or even gotten close to completing, I dare say, Deshiel said. A bold claim, ha! The big man laughed. Deshiel knew Habengut, and knew nothing the man said was ever intended as belittling or taunting. Sometimes it just came off that way. Now, what would that be? DeShiel watched as Habengut turned his sizable body towards the enormous map of the Empire, covering an entire wall of the smoking room. Pins with coloured heads dotted the map, signifying where a discovery or exploration had taken place, as well as by who. DeShiel saw his own pins, turquoise with his shield, the falcon emblazed on it, appear half a dozen places on the map. It becomes harder and harder to discover something truly new, Habengut said, as much to himself as to Deshiel. As the empire spreads, the exotic becomes the ordinary and household. Did you know that we've had to remove five of our objects in this room in the last two years, simply because they weren't special anymore? Deshiel knew. Since the new train line from Granston to Vuongo opened, spice pods were not unique anymore. They were not common, as they still cost quite a few crowns, but they were within reach of almost a third of the empire by now. 
and the empty shell of an aero squid was removed when it turned out that the squids had inhabited several cave systems and abandoned mine shafts in the empire, some as close as Ironhead. Projections put the aero squid as a candidate for the worst invasive species in a few hundred years. They decimated native birds like nobody's business. The search for something new was the reason many adventurers were travelling farther to make new discoveries. On the big map, pins radiated out from the centre like a star. De Shield's eyes roamed over the pins. The machinists were, literally, up in arms over the influx of adventurers trying to trespass on sacred lands. In the rainforest of the south, at least three adventurers had so far tried to find the golden pyramids of Arch Tarama. The Emperor had to issue a direct warning against trying to gain access to the World Spire. There was, of course, a newfound sense of fame found in adventuring, something which confused the Elder members. Alright, so let's just see what the um, genus room is saying. Always right and never wrong. Uh, Jerry's strong reaction to begin with, great first line. Um, Andy D uh, started with the bet, so it begins. One of these is enough, I'd say. Um, there are rather too many names, says Jay, and places in the first paragraph for me. Setting reminds me of Vashti Hardy, says Kate. Bit 19th century, Galadriel, and I think Kate echoes that. Yeah, 19th century pastiche, says Kate, but deftly done. Then she goes on to say, maybe should start in another place, needs a stronger hook. I want a reason to care, says Vagabond, and although the writing is very competent, I'm not getting that yet. Galadriel says, distancing. Great imagination, says Andy D. Um, a play here, but it needs trimming down so we can see the protagonist more amongst it. Um, fantastic first reaction, Sarah. Yeah, I I, um, I, I I think the blurb was excellent. I really thought the blurb, even though it was cut off, I still thought they had the right mix. It was sparky, mm. I, so I was, you've I was gone, excited. You've it 100% that, which is brilliant. Five stars. Uh -huh, I have, yeah. I have. And um, I think it just needs some tightening. I think I'm echoing what the, the, the room has said, really. Um, just great imagination. You have so many things that you've thought of so that you you i know that you had this world is real to you i it no is. doubt and i feel like mm. i feel like there's a map you have that map on your wall you have those pins on your wall and all those amazing details it, i think it's too much in mm. the beginning mm. i'm i was kind of by the end i'm re i'm raring to go you got me and, yeah. and i think like the 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 first line you said it started as things these things often do with a bet and i thought why not just say it started with a bet because when you say as these things often do then i go oh it's common i don't think you know and it, it, it i'd rather it be just and that's kind of the example of where I, what i think needed to happen throughout just um you have all those wonderful things and you're telling me all this information and i think it's just a, a bit too much but i have high hopes because i think there's a, some great detail and i and i feel confident in the world that he's built i just am ready for i'm ready to go on that journey i'm ready to find out yeah. what that um that adventure is yeah i think you're absolutely right there is at least mentally maybe and physically we, well, we're not privy to asmus's uh, uh writing area um but there is definitely a a, a sort of a, a pasteboard out there with pins and he definitely knows his world inside out I, um, I, uh, Kate was saying 19th century pastiche. I'm not wild about that. You often find, you know, writers do start like that. And I don't know if that's terribly relevant to today's reader. I never like it too much because it seems derivative. But as the thing went on, it actually became more original, I thought, and more interesting, mm. actually. Mm. What did you think, Annie? Um, I, I kind of agree with what um, you were saying about the 19th century um feel that it had to it and it kind of has that similar beginning that most um, expedition books have to them of you know someone giving a bet as to can you do it or not and things like that and um, but there's one thing that jumped out to me which was um, when they were talking about how the um, objects are no longer special and how there's um, you know they've got this sense that some of the things that were exciting before are no longer that interesting mm. and i think that if you kind of focus on maybe that kind of sense that would maybe help it stand out a little but there, there is a lot of like you get a sense that there's a world there that that he's he's obviously built this world and um 
especially when talking about where other people had gone on expeditions and you talk yeah. about all these different places. Um, but yeah, I do agree it was maybe a little bit too much when, especially for the first chapter, and it would maybe be better to get a sense of who the character is a yeah. little more before. I think that would be insightful. More. Yeah, that's what the genius mm-hmm. room says too. Maybe starting in the wrong place. Uh, Johnny says, Phineas, uh, Phileas Fogg, isn't it? Oh, Phineas, Phileas Fogg vibe. And Vagabond says, would have been nice if we'd gone straight to the bet, of course, which is exactly how um, Round the World on Asia Day started. Um, let's just see now, actually. Yeah, here we are. Uh, so you've crept up to 61% Asmus, which I hope you're pleased with. Um, very, very, you should be very pleased with Sarah's vote for your blurb. She's given you absolute maximum points on that. And uh, Annie thinks that your writing craft is pretty darn good. Yeah. um, Yeah. Um, And so does the Genius Room too, so you should not be unhappy with that. It's a very good start, I think. Let's see what's next. When you join our weekly huddle, certain things happen. No, not that. Bring your writing, your book titles, your blurbs, anything really for expert and sympathetic input in confidence. Other websites charge a fortune for this kind of thing. In Latopia, the oldest community for writers on the net is included in your modest subscription. Latopia, we're here for you. As we are. Yes, of course, always here for you. Um, Second submission of the day comes from Madarika, who I think is live with us now on YouTube. There you go. As if on cue. Nice to have you along. Very, very nice to have our authors along live. Actually, I know it's been nerve wracking sometimes, but um, it's great to, you know, to have your reactions. And there's a QR code there too. So if you want to go to the link that Madarika wants you to go to, just scan that on your phone and you go straight off there. It's fantasy and it's called Dustria. And this is Madarika's blurb. Sula, a gifted young surgeon, makes a terrible mistake and flees to Dustria, a land of monsters and broken things, to punish herself. But she doesn't really learn from her mistakes until she's presented with a situation where she must choose between confronting her past or continuing down an unexamined path. Dustria is for the questioning reader, examining themes in unrequited love, substance abuse, sexual diversity, and enduring friendships. And I'm going to tell you about Madarika, a freelance writer journalist whose work frequently play- appears on the Hindu, in his leading national newspaper and the op ed. Uh, she's an engineer and holds masters in biotechnology from Columbia University in New York. She loves to write but lives for music. Okay, so we're we're number two on your list, are we, Madarika? I see. All right, fine, got it. Yeah. Uh, she lives in Chennai, India. Madarika's short fiction and non-fiction have appeared in literary journals and magazines actually everywhere. There's a long list. I can't read them all, but it's very impressive. So impressive, in fact, we've got a reading from Ali. Dustria by Madarika, read by Alison. Prologue. Alacrinth was famous for its beauty. The city sprawled below, a glistening jewel bathed in the pink hue of sunset. Seagulls swayed over the horizon, painting the sky with their milky white, and kissing the ocean at times, breaking the calm of an otherwise perfect dusk. Once that pink hue meant the afterglow of bloodshed, but now it brought to mind the pearly calm of a slowly formed seashell. The city wound down beneath him. Srivrajura, you have visitors. The voice broke the peace. Not another long evening, immortal Rojura thought, and immediately felt guilty. Perhaps not. Perhaps it was Prince Iliath, wanting to talk of his imaginary problems with the Ministry of Sobriety and Social Welfare, he mused. That could be quick. Or how to fix a situation with a farmer's union strike without dipping into the coffers. That would be not so quick. As if reading his thoughts, the valet offered, It's the Ministry of Magic. Minister Fillet wants a word. Rojura groaned. No doubt wanting further insights into the mysterious ways of the preternatural. This is what happens when you set up a ministry that serves no practical purpose. Still, things were not like the old days, Rojura reassured himself. How the old civilization had lost track of time. The darkness that had descended on the world seemed like a distant memory, a time when people had ruined their lives with consumption. 
They slept with each other with abandon, forgot pledges to take care of the old and young, drank poisonous sapphire to oblivion, and, above all, allowed themselves to forget where they'd come from. Books, the gatekeepers of accountability, were left to crumble and wrinkle into the flames of eternal amnesia. They were completely caught unawares when the sickness descended upon them like a thunderclap of misery, too preoccupied with their ruinous profligacy, naked and helpless against the rising of the others, the monsters born of the illness and illicit desires. But then magic stepped in at the very last minute, when all hope seemed lost and order had been restored. Perhaps it was the peace the vista inspired. He closed his eyes. The seagulls continued their squawking high up in the azure sky. It took several moments for Rojura, the immortal guardian of the Western Kingdom, to register the rivulets of red snaking their way down the front of his robe. He touched the viscous liquid, feeling light-headed. A searing pain raced across his throat. He clasped his neck, collapsing onto the floor, his hands bathed in warm blood. In the shadows of the drapes that skirted the balcony stood a dark figure, patiently witnessing the life being snuffed out. Not so immortal now, it hissed. The moment needed to be marked. After all, this was blood that hadn't been spilled in three thousand years. The sacred blood of the immortals. Part One The blood emerged like a red satin ribbon from the incision. She sliced into the body with an expertise far beyond her years. The heat of the living, breathing bodies circling her, observing her, wafted up her nape and over her ears, making her hair stand on edge as she bent over the patient. Her skin was cold to the touch, but she was a cauldron of heat inside. The elixir warmed her innards, lit her loins, and stilled her to a deathly focus, where all she saw, all she felt, was the movement of her hands in perfect symphony with her mind. The darkness lurked beneath her skin, threatening to cascade out, but she harnessed it now, somehow, and its power felt limitless. Salatant was performing her first surgery, high as a summer sky. The intoxicant coursed through her veins and tugged at her nerves. Surgery was a precise sound, and Salatant had always extracted great comfort from that knowledge. The cuts and incisions had to be carefully timed, the sutures meticulously braided together, combining skill and craft. But now she tested the very limits of its scrupulous tenets, the sapphire bathing her senses with a milky calm, dissolving the boundaries between the possible and impossible. Nothing. Sorry, um, slightly elided that at the end there, and I think possibly, um, for the first time ever, we somehow missed out a paragraph, which is a bit disturbing. So many apologies for that. Um, too much backstory, says Ancora. Lyrical prize, says Kate. Um, what else are we... Uh, oh, Johnny just realised it was a prologue. I did too. I've just uh, just injected myself with adrenaline to get over my allergy to prologues. Um, but I'd like to know what you made of it, Annie. Right. Um, I, I really liked it. Um, I know that prologues can be a bit of a can be a wee bit off-putting, but I think in a genre like fantasy, especially when you have to um, do a lot of world building, something that's kind of short and sweet at the start that kind of gives you an insight into what the main character is going to go into later can sort of it, it can keep you um, sort of wanting to see how they're going to interact with that later. Um, yeah, I, I do agree with what the with what the chat is saying um, in terms of info dump. That was a little bit. I think especially for a prologue, that you should kind of keep that out and try to focus more on on the character and on the fact that um, this character who we've just met is um, is murdered at the end. At least I think that's what happened. So oh, I think you try to like. Yeah. I think I think that's what happened. That's what I think that's what happened. But I would try to like expand on that a little bit more because that's kind of the focal point of that. Um, yeah. But I really like the writing. I feel like the um, um, like the the prose is, is is very good, and it got a really different sense of character between the prologue and then the first chapter. There's there's a like different voice there, which I think is quite yeah, hard to is. do. Yeah, there is. 
There is uh, very mm. much so. I, I noticed that, and I think everyone in the chat room did too. In the genius room, uh, Annie, you're going to have to press your vote button. Oh yeah, because we're Let's looking, see. we're missing Annie's votes right now. Oh, um, right. Last line of the prologue. So, like, go on. Sorry, go on. No, um, I also I was going to say I like that the premise as well is something that I I really uh, liked. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad no, you I mean, voted. You liked something. Yeah. <laughs> you pushed your way up there. Yeah. Madarika, Madarika will be your biggest fan without a doubt. You love the title. You not I mean pretty yeah. pretty on the blurb. You love the craft. You love the commercial appeal. Um mm -hmm. what's not to like? Is there anything you criticize on this? Well, yes, the the blurb um I I felt it was too vague. The okay. the blurb was kind of too you know, general things but no details. I think Got that's it. something she would have to work on. Got it. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, yeah, I think the writing was beautiful. I think that opening paragraph, I was just like stunned. I think it set such a beautiful tone, especially when what was going to happen later was so dark. Um, so I thought the writing, I think, I think she can write. She can absolutely, um, she's got that going on. I found the prologue, um, a bit confusing at times. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I think I'm with, uh, my colleague Annie and in saying kind of get to you know maybe stop some of that even though there was such a lovely subtle humor there um, when you're talking about oh if it's this problem it's going to not take so long but that could take a little longer I mean there was a lovely subtle inner voice and humor that I quite liked um, and then yeah the, the character though I wanted to know the character a little bit more because I just wanted to know a bit more especially so then I would really care deeply that he was going to meet an untimely demise um and then chapter one we didn't get a lot of chapter one but um i thought yeah i was i, I was interested i think um the switch confused me a little bit and i wasn't always sure um so she was on sapphire which we found out earlier maybe is maybe a drug and so she was performing her first surgery under the influence of this yeah apparently um, so. and i don't yeah. know I, thought, I found that i found that a little bit confusing at times um but I think there was some lovely writing there. And so when you find that kind of voice, I'm willing yeah. to keep turning the page, you know. Good, good. Um, and right. the only thing I think about the blurb is the blurb, the, that last line, I think Kate said this in the Genius Room, is that when I hear someone say it's themes of blah, 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 that just, that makes me, that turns me off a little bit because I want it to yeah. come out in the blurb and, and in the writing. And I'm always afraid that it's not going to be subtle if it's... Yeah stated that directly in the blurb if that makes any sense and that's i know that's totally. a personal yeah no no i i what what you say is is the word of god basically <laughs> that's that's what we refer to in, in, in the trade <laughs> yeah if sarah comes out with a pronouncement then everyone wow. bows down i just want to tell everyone um what lex has said because um the thing is as, as you can see actually i've just switched to the genius room for a moment as you can see um the types uh, the type si of uh, size changes according to how much goes in your posting okay so if you've got a lot to say can i just remind you please can you break it up into two posts so we can read it because i'm going to have to read what lex has just said and then i've got a very important announcement um, and like I said, for me, the second case in a row of a writer who clearly has wonderful ideas and a great vision of the world uh, and the story they want to share. But instead of drip feeding it to us, we get big chunks of exposition. Less is more. Lead us through the world. Don't hand us a stack of reading about it. Chisel it down a bit. Couldn't agree more with that. Mm. Madarika says, thanks for incredible feedback. Now, I have something to tell you. We just got an email from uh, Madarika saying, um, I have received and accepted an offer for publication of Dustria from a small Canadian publisher of speculative fiction um, as of today. Um, I could, she says, I could always use um, a quotable reference from an esteemed show such as yours. Okay, so if anybody, so so first of all, um, we are definitely going to keep you in in this. Yeah, congratulations! Look, Annie, you were right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell anyone this beforehand, but you were <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So what we what I'm going to do actually, Madarika, is we're going to leave you in in the show uh, in the competition of the show. But should you win, and sixty eight is a damn good 
right actually should you win i'm going to take you out of the monthly contest because there's absolutely no point sending uh, a book that's already got a publishing deal to our uh, esteemed publisher ahead of zeus so we won't be doing that um but we will be le leaving you in the uh, in the in the show itself um and what i'm going to ask you actually genius room and our this is very unfair, but I'm still going to ask our, our, our live panellists, if you want to give Madarika a little endorsement to use on her book, you can do that. You can do that either now or give it give it a minute or two, maybe after the next submission. I've been thinking about it ever since I've read your email, Madarika, and I've got... I always like short endorsements because I think people read them. I've got one for you here. Dark, comma, disturbing and beautiful. Peter Cox host of pop-up submissions you can use that very happy for you to use that if anyone else has got an endorsement they want to add take it away now and we come back and uh, ask our esteemed guests um about their possible endorsements if they want to oh she's happy as the dog at two tails Thank you. Thank you very much, Madarika. Um, we'll come back and ask them after the next submission, actually. This is submission number three. And it's from Lauren, who has not yet got a publishing deal, as far as I know. And if you have, you should let us know. Uh, it's new adult fiction. That might need a bit of explaining. New adult. I'm not quite sure what it means. I think I know what it means. New adult. I bet Sarah knows. Uh, there's a QR code there. And this is this is Lauren's blurb, and it's sort of <clears throat> it's kind of a two-part blurb, really. So elevator pitch. <laughs> okay, elevator pitch. Imagine being a student with no money, a low-income job, and rent you can't really pay. And then all of a sudden, having all the money you ever dreamt of land in your lap. Seems ideal, right? Well, money isn't everything. And certainly can't buy your happiness, as Robin finds out. All right, now, uh, before we go to your blurb, I have to say that's not really an elevator pitch. I can tell you more about elevator pitches if you want. And if you're joining us live, uh, just ask me, actually. Um, and then we have part two blurb. It's an accepted fact that students are well known for a few main things. One, <laughs> drinking too many Jager bombs at Epic Wednesdays and regretting it the next day as they drag themselves to a seminar. Now, I don't know if there were further points there, might have been, or it might have been just that's all the students are known for. I don't know. But that's the only point we've got, because at that point you were cut off. Let me tell you about uh, Lauren. I'm inspired by real life events and the characters I create are inspired by people I know. I hope you don't get sued. Um, as aforementioned, I've been writing since I was 11. Has that been aforementioned? And used to post my work on the writing site Wattpad. I'm aware of that. As a novice in my teenage years, um, this term, I'm partaking in a creative writing class as an elective for university, which suggests you're, you're still at college. And I hope to sharpen my skills and pick up on a new, on new techniques. Although cliche, I was originally inspired to write by the Harry Potter series, and I've always loved reading, even as a child. Good. Um, I'm also passionate about humanitarian work, which is what I want to do with my degree. Um, you don't say what, actually. It's always quite interesting to know. And I try to incorporate this into my recent work. So I believe my work would appeal to adults in their late teens and early 20s. So that's your definition of new adult. Um, at least from a target audience perspective, because the themes are broad and relatable. Which pretty much sums up the reading by Kay. The Big Broke Break by Lauren Walsh, read by Kay. Chapter 1. Coconuts You're more likely to be killed by a falling coconut than win the lottery. Robin frowned, leaning in closer to the words and narrowing her eyes at the pointless little fact on the back of the smoothie carton. How had they figured that one out? Shaking her head, Robin placed the passion fruit smoothie back down on the fridge shelf in front of her the harsh bright light of the fridge making the blue packaging shine almost mockingly as she seriously doubted the printed trivia. It was a particularly frosty Friday afternoon in November and the on-campus co-op was packed full of students 
either hurrying in for cover from the snow or who had finished their day of seminars, workshops and lectures and was preparing for their weekly pre-drinks before their night on town. Aisles of students hastily loading their baskets full of beer, cider and pizzas as they excitedly chattered about how their night would go and their plans of action. Robin was pushed forward by one of these said Friday clubbers, who, in his defence, turned around muttering apologies. It's fine, don't worry about it, Robin smiled, pulling her jean jacket tighter around herself anxiously as his friends further down the aisle turned to look at her. She had known the guy who had brushed by her as Dennis, a third year who briefly dated one of her course mates, Violet. Very briefly, in fact, only really recognising him by his shocking green hair and his cheap James Bond aftershave that lingered on Violet's favourite leopard print scarf for weeks. Dennis's lime quiff appeared again in the corner of her eye, standing at the lottery station scribbling his numbers down quickly as he hunched over the small ticket before laughing at something his friend said and swaggering away. Keeping her eyes on the lottery station, Robin noticed that it was shaped weirdly, a collection of circles held together by blue plastic with a large clear dome displaying the brand. More likely to be killed by a coconut, hey? Robin thought. She smiled, the very fact amusing her at its ludicrously. Honestly, how much were these smoothie fact writers being paid to string something like that together? Robin seemed to find herself pulled towards the station. Maybe it was because Jack always did scratch cards and won the occasional fiver. Maybe it was the fact that her mum had got a lottery ticket every week since she was a baby. Or maybe it was the fact that money was tough and she had barely scraped by with rent last month. But Robin found herself now stood directly in front of the awaiting tickets, a strange feeling bubbling in her stomach. She thought of her granddad and his fondness too for lottery tickets. If I ever win the lottery, I'll buy you a bright yellow Volkswagen camper van. She gulped, nervous all of a sudden. She looked down at the pen, mere centimetres away from her twitching fingers. Should she or shouldn't she? To be fair, on her shift just last Saturday, Robin had gotten that tenor tip from that guy who always drank too much champagne and it was still all scrunched up in her purse. So she definitely could afford the ticket alongside her canned tomatoes, olive bread and bottle of rosé that weighed down her basket. Her uncle was going to kill her for spending her money this way rather than investing it in her education or whatever, but she shrugged it off and leant forward. Pick six numbers, enter our draw and win £33 million. 33? Bit specific. Robin continued on anyway and began to write down her numbers. Six, her mum's lucky number. Eleven, the date of her sister's birthday. Fifty-three, the age her dad had just turned. Sixty-nine, the number of the house she shared with her housemates. Twelve, her own lucky number. 82. The number of sources she had just read for her newly submitted essay. And with a sudden desire for Gabby's coconut curry, Robin was whipping out her yellow iPhone and hurrying to the till, a few concerned people turning to look at her as she hassled past them. I was just looking at the uh, the genius room. Johnny apparently did one euro millions on Friday. He went £4.70. <laughs> um... Getting a sense of where that windfall is coming from, says Kay. Another funny sentence, says Johnny Vagabond. Sorry, I miss. I may have misread. I thought she was in her own fridge. Um, Jay says the tense is present and past, and that's very disturbing actually when that happens. Uh, distancing says R K. Lotto odds forty-four million to one. Uh, Andy says you're that skint, and you buy olive bread. Yes, I was wondering about that too. Um, Sarah, before we get your expert opinion, let's just talk about this this question of new adult that's been sort of banded around for a year or two now in the business. And I, I, I'm, I'm guessing really that Lauren is actually in her own demographic. She's writing for people more or less her age, um, and that's. Mm that's sort of called new adult or or is it i mean is it is it is it a real thing do you think a, a few years ago it was starting i was starting to hear a lot about it and people were were writing it but it feels like that's kind of tapered off a bit and i'm yeah. I, I think i'm not sure where it falls because yeah. it, it's 
if to me it's just if she's in college and she's an adult and she's heading that way then it's an adult and if she's a teen she, which she's not a teenager anymore so she's not in that secondary school or high school if you're in the u.s um and i because I, I always think about where the books were or they're going to shelve it yeah and they're probably going to shelve it an adult because i don't yeah think there's a new adult category so um i'm not sure about new adult i hear it and i know there are people writing it and i understand what it means mm. um but i'm not sure i'm not yeah. sure that's yeah, I'm not really sure. I think really it's sure. confusion a little bit. Yeah. 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 Um, so, what did you think? Uh, I'm like, I think the blurb wasn't a blurb. The pitch wasn't a pitch. No. Um, I wanted to know. I, I don't really have a sense. I mean, she's going to win the lottery. Win the lottery. No, win the lottery, and um, and then we're going to see that you know money can't buy you happiness. I'm assuming, um, but I wanted to know more because right? I mean I've heard that story. Um, and it can be funny and it can be engaging and there can be all kinds of things, but I don't really know what journey I'm going to be on quite yet. Um, I love the opening about the coconut. I think I thought that was a, that was a nice humor and I wanted her to kind of pull out that humor a little bit more. I wanted that voice to be a little bit more sparky, but it was, I, I can see the hint of it there. I can see in, the, in that opening line, which sets me up nicely. Um, I'm, I wanted her to have a better reason for buying the lottery ticket because she mm. didn't know why. She, and I wanted her to like, find a pound on the floor or somebody filled out a, a ticket and and she was going to win it and it wasn't going to be her lucky numbers or or something because it just didn't feel i didn't feel like she was making a choice really and and since it's the inciting incident i wanted her to make a choice about it um and i think and i loved i loved that she you know there was a thought behind she picks the numbers because that's what people do which is lovely um but there was a lot of names in there, like Dennis and Violet. Are they going to be? Are they important? Mm. Um, and then there was Jack, and there was Granddad, um, and I didn't really know these people, and I didn't really know if she was seeding them in so that I would get to know them and and uh, yeah, you know, understand. And especially in those yeah. opening pair, those opening pages. I want people in that that you want me to hold on to. Yeah. Um, but I think I think there was a nice there was a nice humor there, and um, I think it could be really fun. And I love you know I always like the idea that you know the skint person. Although I'm with you, the skint person. When I was skint, it was pot noodles and and you know well, yeah. I splurged for a diet. I, I splurged for a diet coke, not a bottle uh, of rose. And all the exactly. bread, I'm just like ready to. But that made me hungry for for dinner. So I, I not that I you know just disliked her choice of, of snackage. Exactly. On a, on a exactly. This is what jo Johnny says. We need to show the protagonist living on mousetrap cheese and three day old baked beans with the mold scraped off. That yeah, that is more like it, isn't it? And Andy says like the numbers, but it was breezy enough. But buying a lotto yeah. ticket and a uni supermarket isn't the most exciting opening. They, they need something. Um, yeah, uh, Michelle um, says walking Ned, waking Ned Divine. Sorry, is a great lottery story. I don't know it, but I'll take a recommendation. It's great. Here. It's a great. It's a great one. What did you think, Annie? Um. Well, I, I like. I liked it. There, Sarah was saying about the um, the humour, and that's something that I agree on. That I picked up on that. And the starting it with the coconut falling in your head, um, I thought that was a very um, clever line. But again, there's that sense of it's the plot is moving and not the character. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I think I that think was right. missing. Yeah, um, I just wanted, I wanted to be more excited actually. I mean, I, I think it was, I don't know who was Andy who said yeah. that thing. Uh, Chandler Jules just said, sorry, uh, but this lottery ticket buying doesn't pull me in. No, I didn't pull me in either. I hear a strong voice, would like more about her mm. tight circumstances before the windfall. And um, RK says, yeah, I think the young ones. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but nevertheless, you've been quite generous with the yeah. uh, little numbers there, Andy, actually. You've gone, uh, yeah, you like the, you like the writing particularly. There, there was like a, a real sense of warmth to it. Like I know mm. there was maybe too many yeah. characters introduced, but the details about our family were were things that I really liked, like um, her granddad and then her mother. And there was sort of this, you kind of guessed that maybe some things happened in the family. There, there are things like that, that even yeah. though it's probably not the best way to start a book, there's still a sense of, um, of a character, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. And there was one thing that I thought, which was that maybe, I don't know if this is very conventional, it's probably not 
maybe you can't write a blurb that way but see with the um the way that she wrote the lottery numbers maybe that mm. maybe she could do something yeah. with that as that a, would be really interesting as a blurb. that would be really interesting mm. do it you know i don't know if they, do you get those chain chain letters chain emails anymore you know uh, do this buy buy lot your ticket with these numbers and pass it on or your whole family is going to die of um uh, scabies <laughs> or something <laughs> Uh, no, that might work. That might work. I mean, we do anything to sell books, don't we, really? Let's have a look at the uh, the score to date so far. There we go. Well, yes. Madarika. Tour de force there. Uh, although, I have to say, everybody uh, likes your blurb. Actually, Asmus, yeah, 68. Doing very well on the blurb front. Um, we have two more submissions to look at. Before then, I think we should speak to the wonderful... So, Sarah, what a lovely painting! What a lovely painting! Tell us about <laughs> it. Oh, uh, so uh, my I'm having problems with my computer, so I'm at my husband's desk, and he has um, some things going on behind there that no one should see. Uh, <laughs> just some just piles, just some piles and some pictures. No, 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 just some piles and pictures. I should have rephrased that. Um, but I was saying that this uh, I painted that, and I'm not saying it's a good painting, but. Um, it was in 1998, and it was my first real writer week-long writers conference. I had used my tax check because I didn't have. I mean, the big broke break was me about then. I was, uh, uh, yeah. but I used my tax check to go to this writers retreat, and they had the opening ceremony, and all the other speakers were there, and I was among writers for the first time, hmm. and I had a chance to kind of lay down in the, in, under this tree and I looked up and I remember having the thought that I'm exactly where I want to be doing exactly what I want to do. Wow. And it was kind of that moment when I went, yeah, I, you know, I'm going to do, I want to be a writer because this is, yeah. the, this is the moment. And um, yeah, it was 1998. So that was several years later until that moment came into fruition. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I painted that because it just but reminds me. Really it reminds special. me of that really that lovely yeah, moment so really special yeah thank you thank you for sharing that with us and in the meantime of course since since 1998 which does seem a millennium yes. away um well mm. i mean you've edited 100 books you've written you've written let's look at, look at some of your books actually um here we go and uh, i've got a big question to ask you actually so yeah let's chasing okay. danger big series um saragrant.com know the hyphen otherwise heaven knows what sort of website you'll go to Might be <laughs> completely different i don't know um yeah. and the these books have done incredibly well the whole chasing danger series i'm going to come back and get you to talk about them in a moment but i just want to ask you something right now because you're I mean, you want to lecture uh, goldsmiths and, you know, the whole thing. I mean, there's no one really more steeped in this whole area of children's writing than, than you are. I didn't, did I just call you steeped? Sorry. Um, <laughs> so, I just, are we doing enough at the moment, do you think, to encourage children to read and to promote the whole idea of reading and writing amongst children and young people? Oh, I think we could, I mean, we can always do more. We can always, I mean, there are great companies like Book Trust and, you know, they're I, going to schools a lot and there are some amazing teachers and librarians who are doing just amazing work. Um, That's frontline stuff. You know, That's frontline stuff. Yes. And obviously there are a lot of very dedicated people out there, but are they getting, are they getting the support and the encouragement from maybe central and, and local government? I mean, I generally yeah, don't know. I, I mean, I think, no, and, and, from from a political standpoint, I'm not sure that they mm. are. They they certainly should be doing more. I think they certainly should be doing more. And I think um, it's you know. I, I, but there are readers out there. I think you know there there certainly are. I think there's a there's a point at time when they start thinking about GCSEs and yeah. as they go into college, we might we lose readers a little bit. But I think we get them back. Um, but I think I mean the best thing that we can do for our children is read and show them the joy yeah. of reading and yeah. and yeah. that's that's I mean my father yeah. loved to read and he always had a book always had a book and you know that just was ingrained in and in, in, you know we had we had a little library at home nothing big just a, a couple few shelves um, but you but, know but in that, those days just watching somebody was, read and loving, there wasn't loving your it. Netflix there wasn't your Spotify there wasn't no, your WeChat no. and all the rest of it and you know we are in uncharted waters now and I, just, I, I mean I don't know what's what's going on what do you think is going to be happening in the next 10 years do you think people are going to be reading more writing more or do you think it's going to be something that's just marginalised I just don't know I mean I, I, don't, I don't have a crystal ball uh, but I think you know we've, we've, we've said oh 
paper books are going to go away. It's all going to be e-books. And we haven't seen that. Um, yeah. And, you know, reader, you know, the, the right books and there are great writers out there. So I hold out a lot of hope. And, you know, when mm. I get a, when I once again get to go back into schools and, and, and talk to young readers, there are lots and lots of young readers. There are kids who are very excited about mm. books and absolutely, um, you know, engaged in, in reading. And so That's very encouraging. I think, I, I think it. I think it's always. You know, I, I'm well. I'm hoping it's always going to be around because yeah, um, yeah, it's such yeah. a big part of my life. And I think, you know, there is something really special. And if you can connect that young reader with the right book, and you can show them how. Exactly. Um, they are working along with the writer to create that story. I mean, that's such a powerful thing than being, you know, watching a movie or watching TV or where, where you're yeah, being which told. which is totally passive. Yeah, Kate You know, which is really kind of just feeding your imagination. Yeah, just th uh, that co-creation that you have yeah. with a fellow um, author when you're reading a book is such yeah. a magical thing. You know, it's such yeah. a magical thing. And and I think it's just finding those, those books for kids. Yeah, Kate mentions that uh, readers, especially boys, actually, she says, are disappearing. She knows about this because she works in a library. Are uh, disappearing into interactive video games. They make their own story. It's action packed, and they are the central character. And that, uh, yeah, we've got, to, we've got to face facts. Actually, that is that is happening. Um, yeah. Your your wonderful series here, Chasing Danger, is obviously um, mm. massively successful amongst young readers. What's it about? Um, it's about uh, Chase and Mackenzie. So the first one, it, it, you know, my pitch is it's um, exotic locations and action adventure. So my, my two girl characters um, in the first book wind up in the Maldives. They're not supposed to be there because it's a getaway for adults. Uh, something really terrible happens and they're the only two that can save the day. So it's, you know, action adventure, exotic locations. Um, I think of it as die hard on a desert island. <laughs> Nice. I love um, and it What's is. It's just, like? it's, so it's our two girls. It's it's friendship and it's it's camaraderie and it's girl power because most of my books are about girls saving themselves. So uh, and it was just so much fun to write. I loved when I was ten years old. I loved Charlie's Angels, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I remember running what around the did. neighborhood with my friends. Well, yes, and uh, and so this was my this is my modern day Charlie's Angels. You know, Fantastic. my girls, my young girls saving the day. They're fourteen. My young that's, girls saving the day. So that's a great elevator fun. pitch. Modern day Charlie's <laughs> Angels. Look at it. There you go. SarahGrant.com. The fabulous Sarah. I can't get enough of her. And hopefully you'll be, you will be back in, in school soon face-to-face -face with, with all your young readers. Oh, I hope so. Yeah, yeah, looking forward to that. Very soon, no one. And now we have number four today. No, we don't. <laughs> First of all, but... There we go. Yes, we do have number four. It's from S.M. Worsley. Here's a name to conjure with. <laughs> Uh, contemporary thriller with animal rights themes. QR code there. It's called Dogs of London. I like the title. I like that title. And here's the blurb. Jaunt is the guy that charities and pressure groups call when they need to cover photos and footage to help launch campaigns. With surveillance support from his gadget-loving hacker housemate, CJ, Jaunt travels to London to infiltrate a suspected dog fighting gang. Everything's going to plan until the men cross paths with Hazel, a troubled former detective sergeant. She's convinced that the gang are behind the disappearance of her sister and are far more dangerous than they seem. Good to tell you about SM. 47-year-old um, woman. <laughs> right, got that. That's very clear, very direct, very straightforward. Ronnie to friends. All right. Uh, can we call you Ronnie? Let us know. I grew up on Merseyside as an introverted bookish child. I've worked as a chef, press officer, mental health advocate, and done night security at a probation hostel. That sounds interesting. Uh, I self-published some vegan cookbooks years back, and recently a graphic novel called Animus. Another good title. Dogs of London is my first novel manuscript, my first attempt to get traditionally published. I completed in June, have started submitting to agents while I crack on with the sequel. I feel it's a gripping story with an original voice, though I have no idea whether it has commercial appeal. We will tell you that. Hence, me bearing my soul here. All right. We shall, uh, we shall entrust your soul and your story, indeed, to the tender mercies of Barbara.
Dogs of London by S. M. Worsey, read by Barbara. Chapter One, Dark Peak, Derbyshire, February 2018. Jaunt hid his mountain bike behind a gorse bush, climbed the stile, and set off across the field. He left the footpath and headed uphill. The going was steep and tussocky, though he resisted turning on his head torch. It would interfere with his night vision, and he'd certainly need that soon. At the next wall, he paused to check his bearing. Definitely the right way. The wall was millstone grit, almost head height. Jaunt peered over. A beam of light in the distance. They were out. He'd picked the right night. He climbed the wall, feeling for footholds with his fell running shoes, dropped down the other side and paused to listen. Two, maybe three men's voices carried downhill on the wind. A faint yapping. It was a cold night, just above freezing, with low cloud and a crescent moon. Jaunt pulled on a balaclava, glad of the warmth. He switched his equipment on and checked that all the indicator lights were covered. Infrared monocular, strapped to his belt. SLR on manual, F-stop 2.0 with 20-second shutter. Pocket-sized bendy tripod, essential for slow shutter speeds. Shutter-mounted high-res video camera with automatic infrared mode and 16 gigabyte SD. Police issue body camera. Hopefully, he thought, he wouldn't have to use that one. Hopefully, this will be a quick in-and-out job. John crossed the next field at a crouching run and reached the edge of the woodland. Hardly daring to breathe, he crept along the tree line until he reached a dense thicket of rhododendrons. The voices were louder here. He was almost upon them. John pushed his way through the thicket, step by step, probing for twigs that may snap. He parted the branches and peered into the clearing beyond. Two men were hard at work with spades, widening the set entrance. A third man held a powerful torch and a wriggling board of terrier bitch. The dog was whimpering, desperate to get at the hole. John levelled his camera and took a shot. The dog glanced over. She must have heard the faint click. John kept absolutely still, his pulse racing and breathing slow. No warning bark from the dog to his relief. The men carried on digging for five, six minutes as John squatted and set his tripod up on the leafy ground. He angled his SLR upwards to capture the faces. Without positive ID, there would be no convictions. He took six clear shots and turned his attention to the video camera. The digging men conferred, tested the depth of the hole and dropped their spades into a wheelbarrow. One pulled a hessian sack from the barrow, moved a short distance and crouched by a second hole. John panned the video camera to film all the openings the men had blocked. There were at least half a dozen. This was a large, active set. At a signal from the man with the sack, the dog handler stepped over to the enlarged hole and knelt. He took a good look around, which enabled clear footage and shots of his face. Off you go, Floss! The dog bolted down the hole. There came an eerie muffled squealing, and a moment later the sack started trashing. The sackman struggled to grip and demanded assistance. Between them, the three secured a sack with cable ties and wrestled it over to the wheelbarrow. Chittering noises came from the sack as the enraged badger fought to escape. Two of them set off through the woods with the barrow, leaving the third to crouch by the hole with the torch, whistling the dog. After what felt like half an hour, the dog resurfaced. She was blackened with mud, limping and bleeding from one ear. Jaunt took some more shots as the man grabbed the dog, attached a lead and set off after the others. John's feet were numb with cold and his calves ached from squatting. He packed away his equipment and emerged from the bushes. The men had all definitely left the area. John headed back down the slope, over the wall, through the lower field and back to the stile. No parked vehicles. Nobody around. And... Thank you, Barbara. Um, several people liking your reading a lot. Let's just see what Barbara's saying there. Um, I'm going to read it out, actually, because it's... Um, do try and break into a couple of comments, otherwise you just get so minutely small, no one, no one can see it, especially in the recording. Uh, Compton, I liked a lot about this, says Barbara, our reader, our narrator. Uh, attention, pace, atmosphere, but I think it lacks emotional impact. I didn't connect with the protagonist. 
We need to know why it matters. John needs characterization. Hmm. I don't know who he really is. He didn't have much emotion or opinion. Hmm. I think the story has lots of potential. It just needs more work. Very promising. And Johnny says the name John is jumping out. And then we've got a slight difference of opinion here between Johnny, um, who's, who's getting YA vibes, and RK, who's not seeing YA potential there at all. So we need to go to the great YA arbiter, Sarah. <laughs> what mm -hmm. do you think? Is this is this YA-ish? Do you think? Um, I I. I, I'm not getting the feeling yet because he's he's certainly not. Um, I didn't get him as a young adult. I got him as a professional with lots of experience, and so the main character should definitely be a teen if we're gonna if it's gonna be YA. Yeah. Um, but I think there I think there was a, a lot to admire about about the piece. I mean, starting in the middle of the action, yes, and I liked it. it the only thing I will say it is, I had too many questions. Um, I wasn't sure there's a wall there and then there was a woodland and I and I didn't really understand where I was I mean you told me I was mm. in Derbyshire but I didn't know what location I thought at first it was a prison maybe that they were looking over the wall of a yeah. prison yeah. Um, but then there were holes and there was one hole and there were two holes and there were a number of holes and maybe it's also I'm not a farm girl so when they pulled the badger out I was like I didn't know so I didn't I really was a bit lost yeah. but i will say that that you were there was some subtlety and that you're you're showing you're showing not telling me what that he's this photojournalist and and that uh, you're starting in the middle of the action which is great and and i love where i kind of wanted you to start was when he started switching on the equipment because all that kind of ramping up and he's going over a wall and he's doing this and he's parking his bike i was like nah Let's get when he starts switching on the equipment. Then I was like, oh, and he has all this equipment. That's pretty cool. And what's he doing? Yeah. Um, but I think there was just a, there was still there was a little too much confusing. But your instincts to start in the middle of the action and really give us a, a good, exciting scene. I think the comments about character are right. I still wanted to know what was, you know, how he's feeling about all this. Um, and you know, he sees the hurt dog, but yet he doesn't, you know. And, and I, maybe photojournalists mm. are like that. I think that they detach themselves. Mm. Um, so that they don't run in and help. Uh, so I, I think there is something to that kind of detachment from a photojournalistic character. Um, but yeah, there's just I just had I had just had too many questions about the location. It was more about the location that kind of kept confusing me, and then what was happening. And again, maybe because I I don't because it's badger culling. Is that what is that what they were doing? No, is it's that badger right? baiting. It's uh, it's illegal. Ba uh, badger culling is encouraged by British law. Badger baiting is absolutely not. It's illegal. Funny difference. I still have, right? and, and I'm going. Hmm. I don't even know what that what that is. No, it's one of those so funny, I'm, funny so it's sort of British things. Me. Yeah, very strange. Okay. It's like like fox hunting, really. Only appreciated uh, okay. by the uh, the upper classes. Um, yeah. So we've got uh, Barbara uh, ads. I think you could let him talk about Jaunt. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I do find the name protagonist name a bit odd. Um, I think you could let him have internal thoughts, yeah. I see he's witnessing this. Yeah. He would have a feeling about all this as he goes on. Um, and Vagabond agrees with you, so saying all the details about the equipment slowed it down, jolted me out a bit. And then I think Andy says, I've got technical questions about the camera. <laughs> Which is not really the reaction we want at this stage. Annie, what did you think? Well, first of all, the um, the blurb and the title, I, I really like them. I mm. think um, especially the, the the blurb because the premise of the, of, of then meeting this um, this detective in London, and I just I just found that very interesting. Mm. I, I do kind of agree with um, with some of the issues with the first chapter, um, especially regarding the character. Like that was the one thing that I felt needed to be maybe slow down a tiny bit just so that we get a bit more sense of who John is and that we can, sorry my street is a bit noisy What's, is, um, it a, is it a tarantula or a flamenco out going on outside? It's a, it's a flamenco It's a flamenco, it's a flamenco nice. car nice. Yes <laughs> No, um, but the it, I have to say it was very tense and like it out of everything tense. that we've read yeah. Out of everything that we've read today, it was the one thing that, as I was like reading it, and as um, as Barbara was reading it, it was just this. Mm. You kind of get that sense sometimes when you're reading something and you're starting to feel very. When when you're able to feel the emotion that's been written, I think that's when you can you can tell it's it's working. But, yeah, yeah. Definitely. So yeah. I think if she's able to add a little bit more about the character, then then it's um, it's a winner. Mm. 
Fantastic. Good. Right. Excellent. Let's right. uh, look at the score state. One there. That is shooting in the lead there. It's got 91 for the title. 75 for the blurb. Um, still not surrendering to Madarika on craft, but uh, overall bang. Uh, pretty much a hit with everyone, actually. But of course, we have one more submission, which could change everything. This is what it is. It's from Cage. It's criminal urban fantasy. And this is a card cut out. It's called Blackened Rose. And this is Cage's blurb. Ah, you've reached the point you'll try anything. Anyone. Have you met the Black? He's the man who deals with problems. No one else can. Or will. You'll need an intro. And I can help you with that. But I have to ask if what you want is worth the weight of your soul. Yes? Okay, follow me and I'll give you his number, but keep your thoughts and fears hidden deep inside or he'll use all your secrets against you. At least as long as you're useful. I'll say again, Ms. Bennett, keep your mind closed. I'm not Ms. Bennett. <laughs> I'm not, not sure. Anyway, uh, let me tell you about Cage. Cage Dunn, dedicated fur, fabricator and teller of tales, a.k.a. full-time writer. Obsessive, compulsive storyteller, unbound by genre, except there will be no humour, thank you very much, whose overactive, childlike mind, you sound so much a writer, with not enough serious stuff to keep the mind occupied, and you sound as if you actually do want to get into humour as well. Um, and how appropriate, isn't it, actually? How absolutely appropriate. You're, it's not exactly your protagonist's name, I don't think. But there is a Mr. Black there. And you're going to be narrated by Lex Black. Black and Rose by Cage Dunn. Read by Lex. One. The New Client. Dull street like backlit the scene and the low wattage small sconces created the effect Black wanted for his visitor. He was a silhouette, a shade within the darkness, a deeper shadow beyond the width of the heavy timber desk, something to fear. He liked to let people know who they were dealing with, and his setup was a clear warning. This time the lack of light hid her features, and he wanted to see clearly of all there was to see, feel for the underlying reason he'd agreed to meet, apart from the voice. Not much to look at, Petite, a touch of belligerence in the stiff neck and clenched hands, cotton gloves, a skin condition. What she wanted was a little thing, specific. Find who ratted on her dad, which was not what Black did. People called Black into fix problems, not investigate. He was the last stage in the game, not a player, an end game move to wipe the board clean. What would this young woman know of his world? the underbelly of society. He'd get rid of her before she got any ideas. But, 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 there was something about her, and someone who knew his code sent her to him. Why? He wanted to know how she got his name, who would risk his ire by blabbing. Black nodded as she spoke, observed her with all his senses. He created a gentle probe, an unseen illusion of an open-palmed hand to caress the edges of her energy field, and floated it toward her. It ground to a halt at the outer shell, a long way from the physical outline. A real person, but the lack of effect was an anomaly. The external appearance of a warm and sensual being was less substantial than the shadows from the play of deepening sunset as daylight faded, and a block on her mind as solid as his double steel office door. Why he'd let her get the interview was beyond him. Even the way she dressed was out of place. Well-worn jeans, cracked full-face helmet on her lap, and a chip on the shoulder. She didn't belong in the rarefied air of Kuyang, Melbourne's most elite suburb, where Black met his clients at night, standard business hours in his trade. The deep cellars wafted cold air into the large room through hidden vents, as cold as death, just how Black liked it. The voice. She sounded like his mother when she was young, and it intrigued him. It held the allure of secrets. He loved secrets. The person, though, he could do without. The way she paid attention reminded him of a rat dog on guard at a hole, ready to bite any who dared get too close. It was unlikely Miss Liana Bennett could afford to do business with him, 
but she was here, so he'd hear her out and let her down easy. She stopped speaking. Black tapped his notes. You could do far better for much less outlay if you went to the usual investigators. He slid three business cards across the wide mahogany desk and inhaled the rich aroma of the non-standard bike leather she wore like armor. Not colorful, not for visibility. Black, brown, muddied yellows, like her hair, like her eyes. Miss Bennett sat so still she almost faded into the back of the large visitor's chair, a chameleon whose boot oil tingled at the back of Black's throat. Robertson the Rogue, Reggie the Rotten, and Powers the Ponce? She flicked the cards back and sneered. The descriptions were apt. That was them to a capital T. No need for dots. The surrounding air hazed, diluted the outline until the effect of the light shimmered her edges. If Black wasn't sure she sat in his chair, he'd question whether it was real. The external street light bloomed, hit her, splintered. A refraction like multiple mirrors slanted at various angles. It messed with how he saw her shape and colors. Very noir, says Galadriel. Yeah, clearly it is. Um, I think very, uh, very positive reactions there. Lots of, uh, lots of atmos, atmos, says Johnny. Uh, he likes to selling it beautifully. He does, doesn't he? Very good beginnings, Barbara Michelle. I'm right in it. Good. This is good, Cage. Uh, says Kate Emily. Great reading, Lex. Um, I'm sorry. I'm looking for any critical comments, actually. Eva, uh, unusual, intriguing blurb. I can't see anything critical. Sarah. Hmm. Um, yeah, I was just really captivated by this. Uh, um, the blurb was kind of not traditional, but yet there was something just sparky about it that I went, okay, I did, I did want to just a little bit more about what the story was about, yeah. but it certainly piqued my curiosity, um, and I thought it was very well done. Uh, I like the black, the idea of, of the black. Uh, and I think that, that opening, there was, a, there was a few about how the light was set, and I think the third line was something like, uh, I was a silhouette, da, 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 and I kind of wanted him to start there, because when I had to yeah. think about the lighting was dull, right. and the sconces yeah. were doing something, and then I didn't need yeah. that, just that yeah. he, he had organized the lighting so that he was a silhouette. Um, it had a very noir feel, kind of like that comic book um, uh, character. I liked that the setting was in what, Kuyang, or I'm mispronouncing that. I thought that was original. Hadn't, yeah. hadn't thought about that before. Um, the only thing is, I think... I got the point that this wasn't his kind of client. He made that point many, many, many times. Uh, he, it, uh, and, uh, but other than that, I, there's something there. I think there's something there. Yeah, there is. There is absolutely. I totally agree. And um, Jay says, and Cage Dunn. That's a that's an author name right there. That's I a great be, author name I, too. He has some great author Cage names Dunn. on the show today. Yeah, it's a yeah. great author name. Forget about the writing. Great names. Um, and black Jane. and rose. I, I like. I like. I like that the title. I do. I like that too. Actually, yeah. It's, mm. it's yeah. It's it's got something. Um, Jay says kind of reminded me of the narration on Sin City. I couldn't agree more. I think you nailed it with that. That's it. Yeah. I was trying to think yeah. of that movie name because it had that that it, it had that absolute feel. It totally did, didn't it? Yeah. Thank you for uh, that. Thank you very much, Jay. Annie. Um, I. I think I'm an outlier on this one. Um, I, I suppose it has to happen sometimes. I does. But, um, <laughs> and this yeah. is your moment to lie out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, writing's a very subjective thing. Um, but I do have to agree, like, it's, there's a real sense of, of a character there, and it is very engaging. Mm. Um, just, it kind of felt almost like it was laid on a bit too heavy for 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 my taste but i, yeah, I guess that's what you have to do if you're writing yeah mm. Mm. yeah yeah and then there were a couple of things i know he's just establishing this character and obviously it's important to you know get that first before you move on to other people but the new client and um, ben i felt like we were just seeing her completely from this um, very narrow point of view and we weren't really able to see her as a as an actual character like mm. and even all the dialogue and everything maybe this is all intentional which is which is obviously fine but the whole conversation that they were having oh, so sorry i pressed the wrong damn button excuse me 
I'm so <laughs> sorry. Like a clap of thunder from the gods. Sorry. So carry on, I know, please. I know you're... Ignore me. You're so, you're so trying to censor me because <laughs> I'm the only outlier in this one. <laughs> no, but I, I just... I've, um, yeah, I just feel like there was almost a wasted opportunity with the dialogue with um, with this character. I feel like if we'd actually heard her speak, then maybe we could have gotten a sense of what she was like as well, instead of just having the whole inner monologue. But it, it does work. So I think it's just, I'm afraid it's a matter of my own personal taste That's, here. that's what we want. That's what we pay yeah. the big pay the big bucks for. Um, yeah. don't, don't really. Um, that's that's great. I think that's very perceptive, actually, and thank you very much for that. So we are looking now, unless there are any latecomers in the genius room, we're looking at 75. This has been a high-scoring show. I didn't think it was going to be. I'm going to press the right button now, and we'll see how everything's stacking. Okay, so it's gone up to 77 now, um, and... Uh, no, 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 it hasn't. Sorry, I'm going to kill it wrong. Oh, okay, so confused. Everybody loves your blurb, Cage. Everybody loves your craft, writing craft, Madarika. And everybody loves your title and your commercial appeal, S.M. Worsley. Very interesting distribution there. Um, and it does mean, actually, that we've got two, two um, uh, manuscripts tightly contested actually for the the top spot um i i'm you know it's always fascinating to see how these these things work out because two or three um submissions ago i was pretty convinced that madarika was going to walk it today uh because that is a very very good score madarika but you didn't and before we actually play the um the fanfare and, and leave you alone for the next six days or so I just want to ask our wonderful panellists if they did have an opportunity to come up with any endorsements they'd like to, to offer or share. If you didn't, you can always do it, uh, send it in next time. Did you manage to either of you? I've, I've got I a little one. It's, it's, oh, good, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> We've both been doing it. We've both been working away Great. Right. that. Okay, far right. away. So, so mine is um, magical, dark, brimming with new and exciting world building. That's fantastic. Annie Summerly says that, wow. Sarah? Oh, gosh. I, I was too... Uh, that's multitasking, really. And I know, so I haven't, I haven't I know. quite got there. I'm Not so quite. sorry. That's fine. So Don't sorry. worry about it. It's absolutely great. Well, all that means, actually, is we do have a show winner, a well-deserved show winner, and this is it. Congratulations. Congratulations, S.M. Worsley. You pulled it off, mate. Many, many congratulations. That's a that's a heck of a score, actually. And, well, we've got two more shows until the end of this month. And we'll see if anyone knocks you off the, the top dog position. Um, I wonder, I wonder. It'll have to be a good submission if it does, but we get some good submissions. Um, I want to say, well, you know what I want to say. I want to say thank you so much to our wonderful panellists, Annie and Sarah. Can't get enough of them. Hope they come back and see us again soon. Everyone behind the scenes, great team. Make it happen. Couldn't happen without some lots of hard work uh, from all you people who you know who you are. And mostly, I just want to say thank you to all the writers who who screw up their courage because <laughs> it's not easy actually writing is you know is is a bit of an introverted job actually you do it in private and then maybe send it out and see if anybody likes it and this is very very public and um i hope you feel that um we take care of your submission and do a good job for you i've had a lot of fun should we do it all again same time next week shall we let's do it Can read my mind.